<laughs> with a really special announcement. One of the things we're excited about in the shift is the opportunity to step into collaborative relationships with organizations that exist here in this valley to actually move the needle more than we'd ever be able to do on our own. An organization that has stepped forward, well, it stepped forward about 100 years ago, that we've stepped forward and joined forces with is the Muring Center. And to announce a, a very special initiative that's occurring next year in conjunction with SHIP, I'd like to invite the Executive Director of the Murray Center, John Mobeck, to break the news. Thank you, Christian, and thank you, everyone. I, I wanted to start, I'm here to announce a gathering that will be a part of SHIP next year, but before I do that and talk about that exciting movement and, and what that might mean to SHIP next year, I want to make sure I thank the National Museum of Wildlife Art for hosting this and for being a tremendous partner on so many innovative projects. This is just one of them. And also to thank Christian for this opportunity and for the visionary way that he's, he's sort of taken the bull by the horns with this, with this shift program. And I think as I talk a little bit about the movement that we've started called Coalition Wild, uh, the Miri Center with a couple of other partners, one of the really key elements of any movement moving forward that's going to advance conservation is listening. And Christian is an astounding listener. Is there anybody in this room who hasn't sat down with Christian to talk about what this could be? Probably not. He's met with just about everybody in this community, which I think speaks to his respect for what's happened before him, what happens today and what happens in the future. To me, it means a lot the way that he sat down and really thoughtfully progressed through what shift could be. So now, what is this little gathering we're going to have next year? The Miri Center, along with the Wild Foundation and Simon Jackson, who just five months ago actually told his story in this very museum, uh, his, his story of how he started the Spirit Bear Youth Coalition at the age of 13. And from, from that age until, until he was 31, he continued to advocate for a rare white bear in British Columbia and showed the power of one, what an individual can do with passion, with conviction, and with a positive message. And that's what this Coalition Wild movement is about. We got involved with the Wild Foundation and with Simon Jackson because we thought there was a real gap in conservation thinking. We see a lot of numbers, 350, 350 parts per million, three degrees Celsius, rising seas might swamp Bangladesh, Lots of negative news. We see news about wolves, all kinds of contentious issues, Keystone Pipeline, and it's overwhelmingly depressing. And we thought, and I know Christian thinks, that nowhere on earth is a better place to celebrate conservation than Jackson Hole. And as the Jackson Hole Center for Global Affairs has done, and David Went has been a tremendous leader in recognizing the power of this place to inspire tremendous movements of people. We hope to do a little bit of that with rising leaders, people who are under 35, people who have tremendous potential to be innovators, to be the thought leaders of tomorrow. And so why is the Miri Center involved? So we're a legacy organization. Marty Miri, Olus Miri, Adolf Miri, Louise Miri. We could think a lot about what they did and, think, and, and start to think about what would they do today? What would the Miris be involved in today? But I think to me, it's more not so important what they might do, but how might they think about conservation? And that's what this Coalition Wild Gathering is about. It's about innovative thinking that might frame a future where we can protect the things we want to protect, the beauty, the wildness, the wildlife, and we can do it innovatively. We can be smart about it. People and nature can thrive and will thrive together. I hope that's what SHIFT is about. So Coalition Wild is a project, it's a movement of rising leaders creating a wilder world. It's really simple. It's just a positive message. It's a platform. It's a website that's being developed. It was a gathering that just took place in Salamanca. Last Saturday, our own Krista Valentino from the, from the Miri Center presented in front of a global delegation, talked about what Coalition Wild could be in the future. 
talked about why we need positive messaging, and it was so amazingly well received that we thought maybe we should think about bringing it here. Immediately after that presentation, I got an email from the National Museum of Wildlife Arts, Adam Harris, who happened to be present. He was presenting at, at, that, at, at Wild 10 in, in Salamanca as well. And he said, I just saw Krista's presentation. It was phenomenal. She was awesome. That was so inspiring. And I thought, all right. Well, Adam, I think we're going to need you to be a partner in the future. And that started, we had thought maybe we could bring this together and bring, bring this movement to Jackson Hole. But that really cemented it. So this is very, very new. This is just a couple of days ago, October, this was on October 5th, that Krista gave that presentation along with a gentleman from South Africa and a gentleman from India, a gentleman from the Netherlands, people all over the world who just have this hunger to express their desire to protect and create a wilder world and do so innovatively. <laughs> so next year, we want to bring this thing here because why shouldn't it be here? This is a remarkably powerful place. There is ridiculous intellect. There are resources beyond almost any place on earth here, both financially, intellectually. We also have the place that spawned the whole idea of national parks in the first place. Yellowstone, talk about innovation, there it is. We've got great examples. I have an example of the Miris at the Miri Center. It's easy to, to see how, how they were able to influence conservation, for not only at their, during their time, but now 60, 70 years later. Olis, Olis passed away more than 60 years ago. Actually, this week, that was 1963, so 50 years ago. 50 years ago this week, Olis passed away, but we still talk about the difference he made, how he, how he talked about the beauty of nature, not just the science, the beauty, the hopefulness, the improvement of the human condition, this has got to happen in Jackson Hole. I'm really proud that we can be a part of this, that this community can develop rising leaders. I, I think, you know, this could, this could be a, a sort of Sundance Film Festival. The wildest, cool ideas come here, and they're cultivated. They meet people who can advance their projects. They meet people who can mentor them. They meet people who are going to make a difference in their lives. But they also make a difference here to this economy in October, and that's important. That's really important, because we can do both. We're pretty innovative people. We've proven it over time. Yeah. So in the future, next year, October 5 to October 9, we'll look forward to bringing international young leaders, national young leaders, regional young leaders, any young leaders, who have a sincere desire in their field to make a difference for now and for the future. And we will respect the power of place. We will make a difference. There's a reason the Jackson Hole Center for Global Affairs is here. There's a reason why people come here and are endlessly inspired. They come to the Miri Center, they're endlessly inspired. I really look forward to being able to do that in the future. There's seven billion of us. Seven billion people. Seven billion reasons for hope. 3.5 billion of those people are under 30. We need them to do some pretty innovative things. They're gonna come here to be inspired to do that. I look forward to all kinds of partnerships moving forward. Talk to me, talk to the Miri Center about this, because we're looking forward to this. This has been a long time coming, and the young leaders of the world should be meeting here. They're going to meet here next year. Let's go. So that's next year as our kickoff for the complete and full launch of Shift. Thank you guys for being part of our inaugural test run. We have our inside Shift booth over there. That's our feedback loop. If you have any feedback for us about what Shift should and could become for next year during its official launch, please weigh in. And let's get on with the show. Thank you very much. Our next presentation is by uh, Thomas Macker, titled Western Heritage.
This is called Frozen Spiral Galaxy. It is an image of dyed soil moist growing spheres used for fertilizer that soaked up green dye and they are placed above a snow covered lawn. This image is called the Green Planet. It is an image of a glitter strobe like bouncy ball and stars. The photograph is two exposures taken at night. This image is taken with my 8x10 film camera. It is a photograph of five exposures on one sheet of film. The title of the photograph is Earth, Wind, Fire, Water, and Ether. In my wanderings, especially near water sources, I had come across many different examples of fecal matter. On one trail trip, I assembled all the fecal matter I could find and photographed it together. <laughs> the title of this photograph is Beauty Stays, We Go. I was drawn to this image where the landscape is in the background and the illuminated solar operated sign in the foreground states dusk to dawn. This image I took in the Grovant campground. I had been photographing many campers in the campground who were car camping. And this gentleman was looking longingly over at the mountains while he assembled his salad. Oftentimes in the parking lots of the Grand Teton National Park, you can come across RVs for rent, depicting photographs within photographs. The coast of Maine connecting to the Grand Teton Southwest. The sweet golden retriever having its nails trimmed, defenseless against a raccoon, but protecting the upholstery inside the new beacon poles. <laughs> The African gray parrot spotted inside its cage with children watching it mesmerized. Meanwhile, grandmother looks upon the children with warmth and care <laughs> while camping. This image has three titles. The first one is titled Town Fair. The second, Speciesism. The third, Ethics Formation. <laughs> this image has four titles. The first one, Elk Refuge. The second, The Feedlot. The third, Autonomy, the fourth, sacred hoop, broken and scattered. This is an image of some tubers just having finished floating down Flat Creek. I liked the image because it looked like a good advertisement for solar energy. <laughs> This image was titled Exhaust. This is exhaust that can be found in the back parking lot of Big Piney's Man Camp. <laughs> this image is titled Exhaust 2. This is a photograph of gas being exhausted after drilling. This image was taken in the anticline outside of Pine Bay.
Nearby, this image is of an industrial sacrifice zone, a liminal space between drilling sites. The title of this image is called The Site of Matthew Shepard's Bee, Laramie, Wyoming. It is also titled Foreign versus Domestic. It is also titled Oil versus Natural Gas. It is also titled Dennis Worked for Saudi Aramco. My last image is titled Da God or Man Can or Big Piney Wyoming. <laughs> the uh, next presentation is uh, Jackson Hole Land and Trust and Trio Fine Arts presentation. Here it's, uh, wait, no, I'm, I'm way off here. <laughs> It is the Snake River Fund's presentation titled The Snake River, A River Worth Loving. Snake River is a national treasure and an icon of Jackson Hole. Meandering from its headwaters in Yellowstone National Park, it contributes so much to the quality of life that so many of us here enjoy, whether it be in the form of floating, fishing, wildlife watching, rafting, kayaking, or simply walking our dogs along its banks. It seems that as long as people have lived here, they have loved the river for many of the same reasons that we do today. It wasn't until June 9, 1940, however, that the first commercial whitewater rafting trip was launched down the Snake River Canyon. From that time on, commercial use of the river and its accompanying pressures increased steadily and over the years significantly. The Snake River Fund was created in 1998 in response to a controversial proposal by the Bridger Teton National Forest to begin charging fees to boaters who are recreating on the river. With inadequate federal funding to meet the demands of increasing use, the fund, through voluntary donations of time and money, made it possible for the Snake River to remain fee-free. Since that time, we've provided more than a million dollars for river rangers, trail repair, restrooms, sign installations, search and rescue training, AEDs, recycling receptacles, bear-proof trash cans, ramp and parking maintenance, among other projects. We've increasingly become the voice for those who love the Snake River in Jackson Hole. The Snake River Fund was a key player in the campaign for the Snake Headwaters, a grassroots effort led by a passionate group of anglers, whitewater boaters, conservationists, and business owners from Jackson Hole. The goal is to find a way to permanently protect the most pristine rivers and streams in Wyoming Snake River watershed by including them in the National Wild and Scenic River System. The goal was realized in 2009 when almost 400 miles of the Snake Headwaters were included in the National Wild and Scenic River System making this our nation's second largest single system designation. Almost all the rivers and streams that are so loved by residents and visitors alike are now permanently protected in their free-flowing condition. <coughs> Human beings tend to care for what they know and experience. To that end, we believe in the power of educating those who guide, recreate, or simply enjoy the Snake River. Each year we hold a conference, Summit on the Snake, which provides quality education that highlights the natural, human, and environmental history of our watershed. Our goal is to broaden the public's appreciation of the Snake River. 
topics over the years that address everything from the history of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, to geology of the Snake River, climate change and its effects on cold water fisheries, to the history of commercial rafting or how to run a successful river expedition. Federal, state, and local biologists and land managers, university professors, and professional guides have been among our speakers. Someone once said that teaching children about the natural world should be treated as one of the most important events in their lives. We believe that, not just about the natural world, but about the watershed in which they live. What better way to do that than to get them in the water and on the water in a way in which they are learning but having a time of their lives. In the classic tale, Wind in the Willows, Rat enthusiastically exclaimed to his friend Mole, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, half so worth doing as simply messing around in boats. Kayaks and paddle boards are just one of the ways that we accomplish our goals for the students who are in our five-day watershed education camp. Home to the native Snake River Fine Spotted Cutthroat Trout, the Snake River by the Murray Ranch is the site of their introduction to the art of fly fishing. Thanks to the help of wonderful volunteers from Trout Unlimited, they not only learn how to cast, but incredibly, fish are caught and then released. For some, an obsession is born. If a lifetime of loving rivers is part of a child's future, one way to ensure this is to camp along a river's bank. Floating downstream from the Wilson Bridge, we pull over and set up camp, a river camp, complete with Dutch oven baking, s'mores over the fire, and the magic of waking up to first light along the banks of the Snake River. Back on the river with the sun just warming the air and cold fingers, we head down to the Snake River Canyon to double draw, kahuna, lunch counter, rope, and champagne. A final celebration of a week immersed in the waters of the largest tributary to the Columbia River and one that flows through their backyards. Fifth grade in Jackson Hole is magic. Part of what makes it that way is all Teton County fifth graders get to float the river for a day. 12 classes, 12 different days, all through the month of September. Coulter, Wilson, Kelly and Moran, and Journeys. For many, it is their first experience ever on a river, 13 miles from Wilson to South Park. Riparian vegetation, watersheds, erosion, maps, Wyoming, the headwater state, tributaries, bald eagles, mergansers, native trout, beavers, levees, and river dynamics are just a handful of topics we speak to when we are on the river. Bow, stern, river right, river left, upstream, downstream we go. 24 bald eagles is the record. Most classes over the years have seen at least 19. Adults and juveniles never ever golden eagles this time of year. Females are larger than males, juveniles are larger than adults. Some say fifth graders are smarter than adults. After a day floating downstream, many of these fifth graders do know far more than their parents about the Snake River. These students love the river, this experience on the river. The guides help make this possible by giving them a turn on the oars, teaching them to push and pull, to move right and left, to go in circles as they inevitably do. My turn, my turn. Every kid gets a turn. Not enough time, never enough. Not whitewater, only scenic, ho-hum, but whatever whitewater the guides can find, they do, even on this pleasant stretch of river. Never before lunch, but always after. Crowding to the front of the rafts, even those who are terrified at the start find delighted joy when the waves come crashing in. Often soaked, always laughing, pure youthful exuberance. None of our youth programs would be possible without the incredible generosity of the whitewater outfitters who donate their rafts and guides, kayaks, stand-up paddle boards, and trailers, because they love the Snake River as deeply as those of us at the Snake River Fund and embrace our desire to let kids here experience its magic. It's been almost 75 years since that first commercial trip was taken down the Snake River Canyon. There's cause to celebrate as this reach of the snake as well as many of its tributaries are now forever protected in their free-flowing condition. As well, the next generation of river recreationists is learning how truly remarkable the Snake River is that flows through Jackson Hole, a river well worth loving. Our next presentation is by uh, Deirdre Norman. It's titled Handstand 365. Handstand 365 is a challenge that I began on April 29, 2013. 
It's a challenge to do one handstand every single day for 365 days, and then each <laughs> handstand I document with a photograph. My first handstand, day one, was while we were driving back from Mexico after sailing for six months. We were sitting in traffic for quite a few hours, and I decided I wanted to do a handstand. I asked my boyfriend to take a picture of me. He looked at me as if I was crazy, but still took the photograph, and that was day one of the Handstand 365 Challenge. This is a photo of me and Amanda Hale doing our handstand. She's also doing the challenge and is in fact the inspiration for what got me started on doing this challenge. Um, super exciting that she actually came to Jackson on a vacation and we were able to do one of our handstands together. As much as I love handstands, at the beginning of this challenge, some days were extremely difficult to get motivated to do a handstand and I found that Every time I was outside hiking or somewhere in nature, my motivation, for whatever reason, definitely increased. I feel so lucky to be living in one of the most beautiful spots in North America. This is a break we took on a mountain bike ride on Grand Targhee, and you can see the Tetons from the west side, which is my favorite view of the Tetons. One of my biggest motivators to be out in nature is actually my dog, Saba. He's a husky and so requires a ton of exercise. So it doesn't matter if it's negative 30, it doesn't matter if it's raining or snowing or sunny. We're outside in nature, hiking or walking every single day. One amazing thing I've learned from doing this handstand challenge is that if you do something every day, you actually get better at it. When I started doing this challenge, I could do a handstand and maybe walk on my hands a little bit, but that's about it. So it's pretty exciting to be able to do different things while standing on my hands. Being on the water or in the water is one of my favorite things in the whole world. However, doing the handstand on the paddleboard is a lot more challenging than you would imagine. I've been practicing this for almost two years and still I can only hold the handstand for about five seconds. Somehow I got lucky enough to go to Alaska this summer, which is truly the most beautiful place I've ever been. And to be able to walk out on a glacier and do a handstand is something that I will remember forever. This is truly one of my favorite spots to come and to practice yoga and to do handstands. This is a yoga platform that was built for me by my boyfriend. And from this platform, I can see views of the Tetons and all around me is just nature. And to be able to come here to practice yoga and to actually truly feel one with nature is one of the most magical experiences. When I began the Handstand 365 Challenge, I had absolutely no intention of combining handstands with nature. It just all happened naturally, and now looking back, I've done 160 days and only two handstands have been done inside. And I love that nature has given me this additional challenge and this additional inspiration for my handstands. Both of these handstands were taken in front of the Tetons, and actually both photographs were taken as I was driving to or from a job. And the thing that I love about these photos is that it reminds me that it's so important just to take a break now and again and the handstand challenge has actually given me the opportunity to stop life for a second and just take in my surroundings and not just be rushing through each day. Both of these handstands were done just outside of Joshua Tree and part of the reason I love both of these photos and both of these handstands is because they were both done on the side of the road and I didn't have to be out in the middle of nowhere or out in the middle of a national park to actually find nature right on the side of the road and be inspired by it. I love this photo and I love the idea of me doing a handstand in the middle of this labyrinth. This was the first labyrinth I've ever been to. And it was a really just a special day because the day started out with a guided meditation with a group of people and it was all led by Shiva Ray and we all watched the sunrise together. Living in a mountain town, I get to do a hike in nature almost every single morning. And even if I've done the same hike every morning that week, each morning brings on a new perspective and looks just a little bit different. 
and I try to do my handstand in a different location on all those mornings, just looking at life a little differently each day. The first snowfall of the season is one of my favorite days of the year. And this handstand is actually done at the top of Teton Pass, and I felt super lucky that I had actually remembered my gloves on this day so that my hands didn't freeze too much while doing the handstand. I love this photo for two reasons. The first reason is because this picture is taken so close to the town of Jackson, but yet there's so little development. It's the openness and the wildness that I love about this area and why I live here. Um, the second reason I love it is because I actually caught myself with the self timer doing a one-handed handstand. I was probably only up in the air for about three seconds, but still, it was pretty exciting. I've been loving that each day each handstand brings out a new challenge. A challenge of this day was actually doing the handstand and holding it in the snow with no gloves on. As much as I love those first snowfalls of the season, I equally love the Indian summer days that follow. And I especially love this handstand and this photo because it reminds me that I live in a place where I can actually bike ride with my dog right from my front door, which is actually the first time in my life I've ever been able to do that. Jackson Hole Land Trust and Trio Fine Art, View 22, Painting Jackson Hole's Open Spaces. I think we can all agree that what makes Jackson Hole uniquely special is its open space. It's these undeveloped tracts of land that give us the view that we've all come to love, all from the valley. This is what's inspired a special collaboration between the Jackson Hole Land Trust and Trio Fine Art artists called View 22. My name is Catherine Turner. I was born and raised at the Triangle X Ranch. It was these beautiful mountain views that led to a charmed childhood. Since I've been cultivating my skills as an artist, and it's developed a real profound connection with the land. It seems that the valley of Jackson Hall has always inspired artists. Years ago, a young artist by the name of Thomas Moran joined the Hayden Expedition to bring back imagery of the West. Along with the photographs of William Henry Jackson, it was the watercolor and oil paintings of Thomas Moran that helped convince Congress to protect the land of Yellowstone for generations to come. My fellow artist collaborators, Jennifer Hoffman and Bill Sotchuk, are passionate about painting this valley as well. We have a vested interest in its protection. This is why we wanted to get involved in the conservation efforts of the Jackson Hole Land Trust. Together we had the idea to bring awareness of the value of these open spaces through our work. We are excited to learn that many of our favorite painting spots were also land trust protected properties. Each week we have researched, visited, and depicted the visual capital of these different properties on campus. My name is Jennifer Hoffman. I came to Jackson 17 years ago with the desire to paint landscapes, and the valley captured my imagination and heart. As an artist, I feel passionate about the importance of preserving the open spaces of our valley. As a mother, I am grateful that these places are being preserved for my daughter and future generations. This project has given us the opportunity to paint at some really special places. My first visit to the Jenkins Ranch, a working cattle ranch with spectacular views, resulted in a drizzly tour hosted by owner Mike Wardell and a lively conversation about the long, colorful history of artists in the valley. On my return to the Jenkins property, I set up along a spring-fed creek running through a pasture and was treated to a parade of elk cows and calves fording the stream as a bull elk bugled from the nearby pines. Later, I watched the bull cross the creek and join his harem in a distant field. Beyond the obvious need for preservation of habitat and history, I think human beings need open spaces and natural places for our own well-being. 
I hope that through this collaboration, we as artists can help bring awareness to the amazing legacy of open spaces and preservation promoted by the Jackson Hole Land Trust. At the end of the long dirt road leading from Highway 390 to the banks of the Snake River is the Rocking Age Barn surrounded by cottonwoods and pines. The barn is symbolic of the history of the Hyler family and their connection to the land through their dedicated stewardship of the Rocking Age Ranch. Hello, I'm Bill Sarcha and I've been painting in the valley for over 20 years and have been especially drawn to the old architecture which reflects the history of this magnificent valley. The Rocking Age Barn is a direct connection to that history. It has been a pleasure to paint the old barn and add my interpretation of this wonderful land trust property. I've had the privilege of knowing Jack and Margaret Hyler through the Jackson Hole Historical Society. Jack's stories of Jackson Hole read by Campfire at his ranch introduced me to the history of this spectacular valley that we share today and which will be preserved for the future thanks in part to the land trust and the generous people that have included their properties. An artist of the landscape searches for beauty that can be shared. The interpretation of this beauty is highly subjective and will hopefully arouse emotions in the viewers and instill in them an appreciation for the great gifts that the land trust properties are to the community. And warm summer day in August, all three of us were invited to paint at the annual Jackson Hole Land Trust picnic. As the sky continued to get more dramatic, we were able to share our artistic process with nearly 700 people and meet much of the community that was also passionate about land conservation. At the picnic, we had such fun meeting the landowners and others involved in this project. We are so grateful to those who had the vision to protect and steward their land for the benefit of the entire community. One of the folks at the picnic was a dear lady by the name of Bernie Rossiter. She's a longtime friend of the Land Trust. And she came up and asked us if we could do a painting of her property. She's an art lover and her, her little spot in Wilson is very special to her and her family. Upon visiting it, I discovered this was a gem of a location. It's right behind Wilson. It has a spring creek, a side channel, and a main stem of Fish Creek. What's more, it naturally lends itself to painting. Bernie and her friend Bob love to fish these channels that provides excellent habitat for cutthroat trout and haven for wildlife. The View 22 project has been a wonderful celebration of art, land, and those individuals who love Jackson Hole's open space. Join our explorations virtually with an interactive map and blog posts at view22.jhlandtrust.org and look for us on Facebook and Instagram at view22jh. Our opening reception for the show featuring work from the project will be on December 6th at Trio Fine Art. presentation. Hi everyone, I'm Susan Scarlato with SHIFT and I'm here to teach you how to vote. So I need everybody to get your phones out. It's actually a presentation where we want you to use your phones only at the end here. But you're going to vote by phone and it will instantaneously, assuming it works, our fingers are deeply crossed, be populated so we know who's won the award. So with the show of hands, let me know when your phones are out. Looks like pretty much everyone. So this is the number you're actually going to text to. And yeah, Jonathan, you can go to the next. So the number you text to is still at the top. It's 22333. It's very simple. Doesn't seem like a phone number, but the text will go through. We've tested it. And then these are the names of all the 10 things you just watched. Can everyone see them? <laughs> Not at all. Even in the front row. There you go. More. <laughs> Can we make it any bigger, Jonathan? There you go. Zoom it. It's 22333. Three, three. That's what you're going to text to. So don't worry about losing that number. <laughs> if there's not a phone with you. We actually didn't think of that. Although you're only going to be able to text 
from one phone, one boat. And I should also mention, out of order, that this is entirely private. We cannot collect your number or anything like that. You won't get text spam from us. Can people see it? The first one is not even there, actually. <laughs> the first one on this screen is Ed Levino's landscape. And what you're going to text in the uh, box of your text is this number keyword related to whatever presentation you liked best. So the first is Ed Levino's oh figure in the landscape. The second is Whole Food Rescue. And you're putting this number in your text. The third is Jackson Hole Center for Global Affairs. The fourth is the Mongolian Wolverine Project. This one's Jackson Hole High School Mountaineering. Thanks, lovely. Teton Raptor Center, Thomas Macker's presentation, which was photos largely that he described, Snake River Fund, Handstand 365, and the Land Trust that we just finished. And what does the winner get? <laughs> Thanks. The winner will receive $1,000 from the People's Choice Award yeah. from SHIFT. And there is another award also called SHIFT Forward that we've already the, uh, People or in the festival already chosen a winner that will also receive one thousand dollars. So this is giving back as our final moment of shift. <laughs> Old school way. Uh... Old school. Or if it doesn't go through. Of course, we don't have any. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> that was cool. This was really cool. That was fun. You did a yeah. great job. That was... And the votes are coming through. <laughs> oh, wow, look at that. Whole food is up front. Wow, Whole Food pretty much swept it. So far, at least. That was great. And if there's anyone in the back that can't see, feel free to come forward. Okay, so while we tally these votes, we also have another announcement about the Shift Forward Award. So the Shift Forward Award is chosen by the committee that picked the films, because we had more than 10 that were submitted. And the committee felt that it best represented what we were trying to achieve this evening, which is me, Jackson Hole, and nature, and someone's passion for what they do in nature. And so the winner this evening is the Mongol Mongolian Wolverine Project wow. by Rebecca Wong. Right. Are you here? Please come forward. All right. Wonderful job. Congratulations. You're so welcome. So Rebecca can say a few words. She will be also winning a thousand dollars that she can give to a nonprofit, so it's the Ship Forward, Pay It Forward Award, to a nonprofit local that is aligned with the Shift mission. So you can, Christian can speak about that, but please tell us more about your project. It's not amazing. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I actually, uh, I'm really bad at public speaking of any kind, especially on the spot, but uh, I just wanna, I, I guess, um, I don't think this project would exist without the people and the landscape of Jackson Hole. Um, they've all, the, the, the energy in this community, which I, I referenced during the, the, the presentation, I, I've always felt like this sort of oddball person. I grew up outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and you know, you talk about like having plans to go off to remote corners of the world, and people are sort of like, what, what's wrong with you? And then I came out here in 2006 for my master's research, and it was like I was coming home to this community of people who truly understood what it meant to have this, this dream to go off and study wildlife and, and to 
explore the relationship between humans and wildlife and nature. And so it's just been a tremendous opportunity to work with the people of this community and transfer that passion and that interest to Mongolia. So uh, thank you again so much. <laughs> I'm truly honored to, to be selected from among so many amazing projects. I think People's Choice Award is evident. It's going to the Whole Food Rescue Manual labor, <laughs> slave labor, just kidding. <laughs> and with the thousand dollars, I hope to really progress this project. We've only been in standing for about three months and I think there's a lot of places we could go and this money is gonna help fund that. So thank you so much. So that concludes the evening. Thanks so much for turning out. Pretty cool to have all of you here. Enjoy. Thank you.